Welcome to the webinar on machine learning applications in antenna design. I'm Andy Nazmul Hassan, a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. I've divided my talk into several sections, with the first one beginning with the basics of machine learning and deep learning, and then I will discuss uh, about a deep neural network, followed by another section introducing the antenna basics, in the last section, I will talk about the application of machine learning in antenna design, particularly in microstrip patch antenna design. So that would be the contents of today's talk. Let's begin our webinar now. So it all starts with this artificial intelligence or AI. It's a broad term. It's a broad term used to indicate any device or any method that acts smartly and uh, under this category of artificial intelligence or this superset we have this subset which is machine learning so machine learning is an approach where it takes a huge amount of data set and then produces an output the output is a mathematical model now a machine learning algorithm can operate on these data sets uh, which can be labeled which can be clearly defined or which can be vague which does not have enough information so machine learning is very intelligent in that sense that it can also create its own pattern to identify the input data and then generate a predictive mathematical model under this machine learning we have this another subset called deep learning so deep learning is uh, uh, somewhat smarter than machine learning it's much more intense in one sense because it mimics the functionality of human brain in human brain we have billions of neurons a single neuron is useless but with the combinations um, and the interactions between these billions of neurons these interactions are the key so um, this deep learning approach, it mimics the multi-layered structure of neuron uh, of our brain and then operates on the input data sets and then generates the output data sets. We'll learn in more details in our coming slides, so let's move on to the next topic, which is machine learning. So into the heart of machine learning, we have this algorithm and we train this algorithm by using training data sets and the input data is provided and this algorithm based on the training data sets it will generate a mathematical model so it's very useful in those scenarios where we do not have any closed form analytical model of any system so in in summary machine learning algorithm it operates on input data and we also need to train it by using a training data sets and then in the output it generates a mathematical model so the quality of the training data sets these will determine how accurate is your mathematical model in the output if we provide enough data sets in training if we provide uh, good quality data sets in the training it will generate a very precise mathematical model in the output so that's the key. So machine learning algorithm can be primarily of three types. Number one is supervised learning. Number two, unsupervised learning. And finally, we have this reinforcement learning. Now let's describe each of these three. In supervised learning algorithm, the training data sets, they're labeled. They're very well defined. The input and the output data sets are present in the training data. And you have this clear distinction that if the input is this, what would be the output? So the training data set is a combination of this input and the output data, uh, which are labeled, which are clearly defined. And these high quality data sets are used to train this algorithm. So it's a supervised learning and that's why um, it can it can create this excellent predictive mathematical model if you provide enough amount of training data sets. 
So this is what the supervised learning algorithm is. In the case of unsupervised learning algorithm, the training data sets are unlabeled data. We do not have any information that what is what. So this algorithm, this machine learning algorithm, what it does, it creates a pattern, a clustering uh, way to classify this unlabeled data. So it's intelligent enough to understand and to distinguish between the commonalities of the existing data sets, which are unlabeled, and then creates its own pattern so that um, it can generate this mathematical model based on this clustering effect. So this is what the clustering comes in. It would classify the data sets into um, several clusters uh, which have some commonalities uh, in, in, in terms of characteristics. So this type of algorithm is called unsupervised learning algorithm. So we need a huge amount of data sets for accurate mathematical model if you want to apply this unsupervised way of machine learning. We have this third category of algorithm called reinforcement learning, which is very, very interesting and very powerful. In this algorithm, we do not have any training data sets. So the question is, if we do not have any training data set, how does it learn? The answer is, it must face the environment. So agent is the entity that learns, so it could be a software, for example. So um, the agent must face the environment through its action. It would interact with the environment. And then it would generate this reward. It could be positive or negative. So positive reward is the reward and the negative reward is the penalty. So these are the two kinds of experiences um, being generated after interacting with the existing environment. And based on this experience, this good experience and bad experience, the agent learns. It continuously learns to know what is what. And if I do this, what would be the consequence? So based on this learning experience, it performs well. So this is very, very powerful. For example, if, if I illustrate it by using this video game, uh, you know that this yellow bubble needs to eat all these small dots on its way and these two jellyfishes are the dangers so if i train this um, algorithm by using this video game if i let it play for several hundreds thousands of times then it would understand it would experience that whenever these jellyfishes are coming on its way they're actually eating your yellow bubble so these two jellyfishes are the danger it would recognize it and it would create its optimum path to avoid these jellyfishes after being trained several hundreds of times this is how it learns it generates its own experiences and then based on those good and bad experiences the reward and the penalty it would learn and this is very powerful and that is why google has created this alpha go which has mastered the chess playing that it can defeat any chess master in the world anyway so now let's move on to this topic deep learning versus machine learning although these two terms are used very interchangeably uh, quite often in the literature in the context of scientific discussion but there, there, there is a slight difference between these two things uh, machine learning is the superset and uh, deep learning is the subset of machine learning so yeah both of them uh, actually belong to the similar kind of uh, domain but there's a subtle difference the difference is in machine learning you know that we have this training data sets and this algorithm and uh, we can apply different approaches of algorithm to generate this mathematical model so in machine learning we generate model from data but in deep learning we have this neural network in the core which is trained by using this learning rule and the input and the output actually are both data it's not a model. So based on the training data sets and based on its learning experience, it would 
create this best combination of input parameters at the output. Learning implies this deep neural network or DNN, which is a multi-layered structure. Uh, the more the layers are, the higher the complexities are. So let's talk about this deep neural network or DNN. These two red dots, they are representing the input nodes. So what is node? Node is equivalent to neuron in our brain. In our brain, we have billions of neurons. And billions of neurons, when they interact with one another, they create this electrical signal. So these are two input dots or nodes. And at the output, you have these blue nodes, sorry, green nodes. Between the input and the output, we have these hidden layers. These billions of interconnections of neurons are represented by these arrows. So from the input to the first hidden layer, we have this um, interaction, these um, black arrows. And then we have this W1, which is our weighted matrix. So this matrix is used to determine that what value is given as the input to the first hidden layer. From the first to the second hidden layer, we have these several interconnections between these nodes represented by these black arrows. We also have another weighted matrix, which is W2 in this case. So for each level of hidden layers, we have this different weighted matrix. These matrices define the input value to the next hidden layer. Finally, at the output, we have this final weighted matrix W4. And then the output is the combination of this complicated interconnections of nodes and these weighted matrices. So deep neural network operates quite similarly the way our brain works. The billions of neurons work together to create this gigantic network, this meshing. This is quite fascinating. So um, one thing is to notice here is that the output is not always what we want. So there is a slight margin of error which is represented by this delta. This margin of error is feedback to the hidden layers uh, in a backward fashion. This mechanism is called backpropagation algorithm. This is used to minimize the error. So depending on this error, the weight of these matrices W1, W2, W3 and W4, the weight of these matrices are adjusted based on this margin of error. So backpropagation algorithm fixes um, this margin of error so that at the output we, we get this uh, the nearest optimum values. One problem this DNN suffers is from overfitting. What is overfitting? Overfitting, imagine that we have these um, blue dots and red dots and they are representing, uh, for example, cats and dogs. Blue dots are cats, red dots are dogs. Now imagine the machine learning algorithm, it created this clustering represented by this black line. So it's a very good merging between these cats and dogs and uh, clearly defining the boundary between these two classifications, right? Now imagine another line represented by this green line, which is a quite a serpentine in nature, a zigzag pattern. But if you closely notice that it is following, following the blue dots, so it is following the path of the blue dots and then curving away from the red dots and again uh, to the blue dots. So it is nothing but an overfitting example. It is following the training data sets very closely. So it is overfitting. Now imagine we give input as a yellow dots which do not belong to um, red dots or blue dots. Now, a question to you is that if we give the input with this yellow dots, then which algorithm, the blue line algorithm or the black line algorithm will work best in this scenario? What would be the answer? Well, the black line. The algorithm being implemented by this black line, it would respond accurately to this input yellow dots. It's because it knows the clear classifications between 
blue and the red dots. But the green line algorithm, it follows the uh, blue dots very closely. So it could not say uh, or it could not identify the clear position of the yellow dots that which category does it belong. So what's the solution? The solution of this overfitting problem is drop out. So what is drop out? Drop out is a mechanism where we train the hidden list node randomly, not all of them. We pick up any random node in the hidden layer and then we train it. So in that way, we actually minimizing the number of hidden list nodes being trained simultaneously. So this is how we minimize this uh, overfitting problem in DNN. So if we summarize the DNN architecture, we have these uh, hidden layers and uh, several interconnections between these nodes represented by these um, black arrows. And the nodes are being um, weighted with this weight matrices w1 w2 w3 w4 based on the input we have this output which is a combination of these hundreds of interconnections of these nodes and these weighted matrices so it mimics the functionality of human brain so that's the summary of dnn now let's come to the basic concept of antenna engineering. The question is, what is an antenna? An antenna has an input and an, oh, obviously it does have an output because it's a system. Any system has an input and output. Now, what is the input of any, of any antenna, for example? The input is basically an electrical signal the output is basically an electromagnetic free space signal or EM signal. The nature of this input and the output is different. In the input, we have this electrical nature of the signal. At the output, we have this wave nature of the signal, which is electromagnetic signal, which is nothing but wave in free space. So the definition, the very basic definition of antenna is nothing but a device that converts electrical signal into free space electromagnetic wave. So it converts the electrical signal into wave. So that's the concept of transducer. You know, transducer, what it does? It converts any electrical quantity to non-electrical quantity. Any transducer, for example, the speaker, let's talk about the speaker. The speaker, the input is an electrical signal. For example, your speaker in, um, in mobile device, the signal is electrical in nature, but in the output, you're hearing the voice of the caller. So the output is a sound, it's a non-electrical quantity. So your speaker is a transducer. It converts the electrical signal of mobile phone inside the mobile chip and creates this sound wave. So this is what a transducer does. It creates, it converts the electrical quantity into non-electrical quantity. So antenna is also a transducer. And the concept is also applicable for vice versa case. For example, uh, in microphone, the microphone, the input is non-electrical quantity, which is sound wave. And then microphone will create a voltage based on the input sound wave which is electrical in nature. So it could be interchanged, the concept could be interchanged. Any device that converts electrical to non-electrical quantity or vice versa is nothing but a transducer. An antenna is one kind of transducer. So this is the symbol of antenna, a triangular with this um, line. Now, um, if we analyze the nature of electrical signal mathematically, an electrical signal is basically, um, um, it could be a sinusoidal current or voltage signal. So in antenna, radiates this electromagnetic wave, assuming the input electrical signal is sinusoidal in nature. 
if we provide DC signal, the DC voltage, the DC current, which is fixed uh, over time, the antenna cannot radiate this, this, this signal because it's fixed over time. So what antenna can do, it can radiate or it can create this electromagnetic wave only when the input electrical signal is sinusoidal in nature. And any sinusoidal current or voltage signal can be defined mathematically by Vt is equal A, which is the magnitude of the signal, times cos 2 pi f of t. Now f is the frequency of the sinusoidal current or voltage signal. Now the question is, what is electromagnetic wave? A wave is nothing but, um, so it's a pattern that travels forward with time. For electromagnetic wave, this traveling speed is equal to the speed of light C. It's very high speed. It's the highest possible speed in nature. So electromagnetic wave does not need any medium to propagate, to travel forward. It can travel in the free space and it travels with the speed of light in vacuum. If we want to define this electromagnetic wave mathematically or even geometrically by this illustration, imagine we have this three-dimensional space presented by this three axis, and then we have this electric field, the electric part of this electromagnetic wave, because the word electromagnetic, if we decompose it, we get electro, which is nothing but uh, corresponding to this electric field E vector, and we have another term, the magnetic. So there are two entities in this word, electromagnetic. One is electric field E vector, represented by the sinusoidal blue curve, and the magnetic field H vector, which is being represented by this yellow curve. So the important thing to remember is that electric and magnetic field are always perpendicular to one another in the free space. And the wave is traveling forward towards positive Z direction. So the axis Z, this is the direction of propagation or travel, uh, traveling of this wave. Antenna converts this sinusoidal electric signal, which is v of t equal to a cos 2 pi of t into this electromagnetic wave into free space. Now let's move on to the classifications of antenna. In the past, we, uh, whenever we talk about the antenna, we felt that, um, that any antenna could be very bulky, very large, metallic in nature. It was true in the past. In the past, antennas were mostly metallic mostly large and mostly bulky in nature. But things have changed a lot. Things have changed, technology changed. Now the concept of antenna can be translated into microscopic level even. There are antennas, there are nano antennas that you cannot even see with your naked eye. We have these classifications based on several um, scenarios. For example, the first one is a dish antenna and the second one is space antenna being used for a satellite. So these are the antennas marked by these red circles. They're attached to this satellite. They're powered by the solar power energy. The signal can travel billions of miles away. So in that case, the receiving antenna would be this big large dish antenna. In astronomical antennas, the size of the dish is very huge. It's like thousands of feet in diameter. It's very huge, very powerful. It can transmit signals to billions of miles away to the distant galaxies and stars. It can also receive signals from those distant places. One thing that you have learned from this discussion is that the size of the antenna matters. The larger the size of the antenna, the more powerful it is. Now let's talk about third category of antenna, which is uh, this Wi-Fi antenna. So it is attached to this Wi-Fi router, rod shape antenna. This is basically a monopole antenna. You can also see this kind of antenna. You could see in your past mobile phones uh, when you have this tiny rod attached to your mobile phones. 
But nowadays these antennas are not used in mobile phone. These are mostly used in Wi-Fi routers. These antennas are basically the mobile communication antennas. Uh, the mobile service providers use these sector antennas. They put it on their mobile towers and they are very powerful. They are very directive in nature. So they can focus the radiation, the electromagnetic signal at a particular direction. Another type of antennas that are very small in nature can be found in mobile device. You can see the red circular parts. So these tiny strips uh, that are marked by these red circles, they are basically antenna and they are called micro strip antenna because they are built by using micro strip technology. So what is a micro strip? Micro strip is nothing but a thin metallic sheet or these lines, these zigzag lines. So they are very famous because they can be integrated into printed circuit board into IC of mobile devices. Another type of microstrip antenna that you can see, this is called rectangular patch antenna. So this is what is our um, discussion about microstrip patch antenna. And so let's move on to the next topic, microstrip patch antenna. So uh, you can see a real picture of a microstrip patch antenna. So I'm holding it. Uh, this, uh, this part is called the substrate. This is a PCB, a printed circuit board, uh, which we are calling substrate. It's a very thin um, sheet. It's a non-conducting sheet, so it does not conduct. And uh, the conducting part is this metallic yellowish part, which is called the patch. And this part, this strip is called microstrip. This is the signal carrying conducting part. By using this SMA connector, which is attached to our wear, uh, carrying the electric signal, we are providing the input electrical signal to this patch. So the microstrip line is the input electrical signaling line, which is injecting this electrical energy to this patch. And after receiving this electrical energy, this patch antenna, it is creating this electromagnetic wave in free space. So the microstrip patch antenna is planar in geometry, so it's very suitable for printed circuit board or PCB. And the application of this microstrip patch antenna could be uh, anywhere. It could be used in Wi-Fi at 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz. It could be also used in radars. For example, if you want to find out some metal underground, uh, you can use this microstrip patch antenna. And they're, they're very popular in EWB radar systems. And uh, these antennas are also popular in medical imaging for tumor cell detection, for cancerous cell detection, breast cancer detection, and uh, any type of medical imaging. Uh, cases, these antennas are very, very appropriate because they are very uh, directive in nature, they are efficient, they are planar in, in, in shape, they can be also made uh, with this flexible design, flexible substrate, so it can bend, it can uh, stick with the profile of the human body. So yeah, this type of antennas are very, very famous in medical imaging. Now, if we want to discuss the basic geometry of the microstrip patch antenna, then we can represent this uh, figure. You can see um, the, there is a patch, the yellowish part, and this patch is excited electrically by this microstrip line. So microstrip line is carrying the electrical signal and it is injecting this electrical signal into this metallic patch which is basically our patch antenna. Now this patch antenna, this metallic patch antenna is mounted on a dielectric represented by epsilon r. So dielectric is nothing but a non-conducting sheet of thickness h which is basically the printed circuit board. Uh, any printed circuit board you see could be modeled by this dielectric. And beneath this dielectric medium, we have this another metallic sheet, which is called the ground plane. So ground plane is the zero voltage reference plane uh, in electrical circuit. So in electrical circuit, we, we take a ground which represents the zero volt. 
So in the patch antenna case, this ground plane represents this zero voltage or the reference voltage. Now, if we want to parameterize this antenna, we can define these variables W, which is the patch width, L is the patch length, H is the thickness of this dielectric substrate, which is the PCB in this case, and epsilon R is the dielectric constant of this PCB material substrate. So dielectric constant is also called as permittivity and F is the operating frequency. Remember, uh, if you talk about any antenna, then you should ask what frequency, what frequency is it operating? So this is the first thing that you should ask if someone discusses about the antenna, all right? And uh, the formula to uh, design this antenna, this patch antenna, based on these variables that we have defined, the frequency, the operating frequency F can be defined with this equation which is C is the speed of light divided by 2 times width of the patch and the square root of 2 uh, by epsilon r plus 1. So this is the equation that gives you the operating frequency based on the dielectric constant and the width of the patch. We have another equation, design equation, in terms of the length of the patch and the operating frequency of this patch. So these are two very simple equations. Now, if I want to apply machine learning algorithm in this microchip patch antenna design, what should I do? Recall that deep learning or the machine learning uh, basically employs a deep neural network or DNN in the heart of this structure. And then we have this training data sets, we have this learning row, and then we give some input parameters and then we get at the output some optimized parameters based on the uh, training data sets. If we want to apply this concept of deep learning into microstep patch antenna design, then at the input side we can define five variables or five parameters WL, H, uh, epsilon R, which is the dielectric constant of the substrate and the operating frequency F. So if we provide this input data of this uh, deep neural network, at the output, we should expect an optimized values of these five parameters. Now the question is, where do we get the training data? Because this deep learning network will only perform well if we provide enough training data. Because based on those training data, which are very high quality in nature, this deep neural network will learn the design of microstep patch antenna. And then if we provide the input, it would provide us the optimum output. So the question is, where do you get this training data sets? The answer is, you have to simulate this antenna for different cases in CST Microwave Studio software or even in HFSs. So both softwares are popular for antenna design. These are two electromagnetic simulation software uh, used in the industry to design any antenna. So what you should do to generate these training data sets, you have to simulate this antenna for many times for uh, different parameters and then create a training data sets from the simulation data. And then, after being trained, if we provide some input values at the output, we should expect some optimized parameters of this patch antenna. So this part, the reddish part, highlighted by this rectangular red um, or pink uh, shaded region, these can be implemented in Python or MATLAB. So this is the basic concept of using machine learning in microchip patch antenna design. This could save our time to design this patch antenna manually in electromagnetic um, softwares. I hope that you have understood how we can apply the concept of machine learning into the design of Microsoft patch antenna. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know in the comment section. And thank you very much for staying with me for so long.